talking about asset tokenizations in the finance industry. And then I want to turn my video off because uh, I'm using my computer and my, my phone because my computer doesn't have a very good um, kind of the camera. So now um, one thing is that, um, uh, so um, let me quickly bring down here so I can see my whole screen. And let me quickly see where we, okay. So uh, basically today, um, what I'm gonna talk about is um, what is asset tokenization means and then um, how you can use that in the blockchain, using the blockchain technology. And then uh, what's the role of asset tokenization is in the finance industry. So uh, this uh, presentation is by DC Webmakers and um, we offer some blockchain consulting development and DC Webmakers. So now, um, so this is the outline. So for those of you who are following this, there is a link in the meetup where you can click on that. You can get the, you know, the PowerPoint presentations that I'm presenting right now for the PowerPoint deck of this. And you can just follow what I'm talking. So <clears throat> basically um, this is the outline of the topic that you're talking today. Um, I wanna talk about what is the tokenization is. And I wanna a little bit talk about some terminologies like ICO and initial coin offering versus security token offering. And then um, what is the legal uh, you know, framework around that? And then what is the benefit of tokenizations? And some of the examples, some of the challenges, um, what are the uh, kind of the use cases in finance? And then what are the adoptions going on and the resources? So um, I know that this is for hyperledger group. I mean, this is a hyperledger community. At the same time, um, my presentation today is platform agnostic, meaning that you can apply whatever you're learning or taking away from this presentation using Cerium for, for, for public blockchain development, or you can use the Hyperledger for a private one. So, um, so these are the topics. So, and then again, um, today discussion is more kind of the um, business uh, oriented is uh, related to the finance and business. And then um, with some kind of the integration to the technology. So I'm not showing you any code or any development. Maybe the, after this, we have another kind of the webinar or workshop focused only on hands-on smart contract development. So again, uh, about, about me, um, I mean, I have uh, been in the tech industry for many years, 15 or 20 years I have been in industry, and then I have uh, like tech companies. I'm also author of the Hyperledger Fabric book. And um, also uh, I have been written a lot in the community on the blockchain, you know, articles. And I have also background in business. I have MBA also. Um, I have done a lot of uh, programming since I was in high school. So um, again, you can add me on LinkedIn if you want to like, uh, connect after this kind of conversation, after this presentation, if you have any questions. So the first thing is that, what's it, uh, again, the first thing is that what is the tokenization, right? One of the things I want to mention is that um, by going through the, this presentation, I'm assuming you know what is the blockchain is, how the blockchain works. And um, if not, at the end of this presentation, I have a slide for resources. So you can go to those resources, um, read some article that they are there regarding uh, what is the blockchain is, how blockchain works, things like that. Uh, so assuming that you know what blockchain is and how blockchain works, um, we, we need to find out, we need to, uh, to know <coughs> what are the application, what, what is uh, one, of the applica one of the application of blockchain is tokenization. So uh, by tokenizations, we, um, we try to uh, <coughs> uh, bridge the gap between the assets, real world assets, tangible, intangible, and their training, storage, and transfer in the digital world. <clears throat> so um, let me simplify this, what that means. So, so every one of you guys know that um, a tangible assets can be something like a bike, can be like a car, something you can touch, you can, feel, you can, you can hold it. So that's like a tangible asset, right? So um, in the real world, um, there are some barriers to, uh, to tangible assets. So barriers can be, uh, if you want to sell your bike, you need to find someone who can afford to buy it, right? 
And then, um, so there is a liquidity, there is a um, accessibility. There are some barriers that we're gonna discuss later, slide associated with some assets. And then, um, so the ability to, um, to trade those assets in the digital world is where the blockchain come to pictures. So basically blockchain allow you to convert those real assets to ownership, we transfer the ownership of those assets in a digital way without the person actually owns that. So when I buy the, so let's say that you're selling the bike and when I buy the bike from you, the only way I can prove that I'm the owner of that bike is by holding that bike you know, in my hand, right? However, using um, like blockchain technology, digital asset, you may not hold the asset in your backyard. You may not have the real asset. You may have a certificate that shows a security or certificate that shows that you have either own all of the asset or portion of the asset. So that's, um, that's another difference. So we talk, we're gonna talk more about that uh, in the other slide. So, um, so basically tokenizations convert the value uh, is storing the tangible intangible object into a token that usually can be manipulated along with distributed ledger technology or blockchain system. So one of the example of intangible object or intangible assets can be um, like, uh, like um, for example, like a logo or, you know, in the bank industry, you can sell your debt, you know, for example, um, or some of the financial assets, the derivatives, they can be deemed as intangible. So tangible, the one that you can hold in your hand, you can it's something like real estate, intangible like a logo or something that uh, has intrinsic value. And um, so basically the value of those assets or objects gonna be um, manipulated. So basically, uh, let's say that you have an asset that was $1 million, you're gonna trans translate that value into the tokens or into the um, another distributed ledger technology where each uh, por portion of that asset, I mean, that asset value is gonna be divided into the different small pieces or token that someone can own it or buy it. So, um, and tokenization can be applied almost to any assets, um, like again, a real asset and then digital assets. And, um, and then the transfer of the ownership and the storage um, without central self So that's another element. I'm gonna talk about this uh, advantage of this tokenization is that um, it creates a mobility for the buyers and sellers to transact at a more efficient way without having going through the intermediates or uh, paying the transaction costs at a faster rate. And with the ability for the buyers to uh, trade their um, token in, at the secondary market. So uh, asset tokenization, as if you search it online, asset tokenization is getting very popular right now. The reason is very simple. Um, so many financial institutions out there, so many companies have an asset that are not liquidable, that are, that are not movable. So, the, uh, so for example, if you have heard the news after, after the crisis has started, so many commercial real estate around the United States are, are, are empty. So no one, you know, no one uh, rent those spaces, their spaces are empty. So that is an asset that's not liquid, but you can easily, you, you cannot, you cannot just sell that you know commercial real estate so easily because it's so expensive. So there are so much asset that um, just 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 uh, hanging around, and they are not liquidable. They are not movable. So you can use asset tokenizations to give a partial ownerships to different people, and and that way you mitigate the risk of the of the ownerships and mitigate mitigate risk of the of that kind of the. Um, equity that you are you're owning. So I'm going to talk about that uh, risk later on. So now asset organizations, uh, there's, there are some key terminologies here. So one of them is the security token offering or STO. And um, one of the things I want to mention in this presentation is very important. This presentation is about giving you some informations and some kind of the overview 
of what is asset tokenization, what are these key terminologies are there. By no means I am recommending one versus another, or by no means I am expert in any legal aspect of um, asset tokenizations. So again, whatever country you are, whatever um, you know, um, uh, platform you're using, you have to consult with your kind of the legal team or your country for the actual implementations. So um, secure token offering or STO, uh, is evolution in fundraising. So I'm quite sure most of you guys are familiar with something called um, crowdfunding. So crowdfunding allowed, um, you know, um, uh, the founder or entrepreneurs raise fund through the you know, microfinancing, right? So different people put some money there. And once like kickstarter.com is a good example. Once a certain amount of money is raised, once the, uh, the, the founders meet the threshold of financing, then um, they're gonna kick off the, the startup or they're gonna start that um, business. So um, why is the evolution in fundraising? Because um, fundraising has been around. I mean, like uh, crowdfunding has been around for a few years. Now using a uh, you know, security token offering or using this kind of blockchain, you can automate the whole process. And um, it makes things like um, using the smart contract can make it much more, um, you know, straightforward to the raising the fund and then giving the reward. Um, if you attended my previous talk, uh, I was talking about um, how you can raise fund if you are an author, if you are, if you are a, start a new book, and uh, you can raise fund. People pay you to write your book, and each person who pays for your book. Uh, can own a pro portion of your book equity, like of your book. And then once the book is published and revenues um, is earned, those people are gonna receive the revenue from the main publishers and from the secondary market using the blockchain technology. So coming back to security token offering, um, there are other mediums, as you know, the traditional kind of the medium for raising fund was angel investors, venture capital, VCs, initial public offering or IPO, and initial coin offering ICO. So ICO and STO are very close to each other. Uh, however, initial coin offering mostly was for cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, things like that. Where, whereas security tokens is, um, is mostly offered for the for the other type of assets, not crypto, not, not, not crypto assets. And security tokens has more risk than initial coin offering because of the, I'm gonna talk about this, uh, because of the intrinsic value of the assets. So, um, uh, so basically, as we, uh, as we discussed early, um, you give a token. So basically, um, the reason it's called security because you know that, um, you know, that it's backed by an asset, you know what I mean? So um, represent a real tradable asset. So you buy a token, uh, token, for example, someone put the artwork for sale, you just buy a token of it, and that token has its, uh, its own value. It indicates who is the owner, what percentage of the ownership is, and on what terms you can trade that asset. And, um, and then security tokens are, um, like uh, like equity, or like utilities, or payment tokens are created through the ICO or STO, and um, so a little bit of the differences between ICO and STO. As I said, the, uh, they have a they have overlapping. There are some commonalities, but there are some differences. So an ICO issues either a coin, cryptocurrency, or utility token. STO issues a security token. Um, which is a digital stock certificate. It is different from the utility token. And um, utility tokens is uh, treated to be um, like a commodity, like a gold uh, with a useful value, but isn't used for security. So again, as I said, uh, one of the key differences is that ICO has an intrinsic value, the value in itself, versus an STO is like um, you're investing uh, in something. For example, if you have been angel investors, or if you know about investing a startup, you know that the startup may or may not go well, right? So you, you have a leap of faith, you have put some money there and you're hoping that your investment gonna return. 
but in some cases your investment goes nowhere. So it's the same as STO, right? Um, whereas an ICO, the asset has less risk because you're buying cryptocurrency or something has a less risk compared to the STO. Now, so um, again, that's the same things I was talking right now. A utility or commodity or currency uh, situation. So again, that's element of risk is uh, another delicate difference between these two. And um, uh, so, and then that differences um, result in different offering process. So I'm talking about offering process in another slide. So there is a whole value chain or life cycle for initiating STO from the A to Z, which I'm gonna talk about this later. So that's you understand that when you're doing the STO, the, the life cycle might be different than ICO because of the um, asset that you're dealing with. Now, <clears throat> as you know, securities, again, as I mentioned, securities are different than commodities. For example, equity securities represent the ownership of a company while commodities are items of useful of value but they are not considered as a right to ownership. Again, that's another thing that I was, again, I was talking earlier. Um, you have to look at STO as investment of like a stock share of the company or as an investment of an equity. And security can only be traded as a registered trading platform and participants of their trade securities are required to register the broker and dealers under the applicable security law. So again, as I said, um, uh, and I'm gonna discuss it later. Um, so there are some um, legal um, you know, umbrella or legal kind of the uh, framework around issuing the securities, trade them, so there's all been regulated. I mean, again, you have to look at your country to see what's regulation involved you know, regarding issuing the securities and um, trading securities, whether you can trade that in the second market, or if you're launching a program or, uh, you know, um, STO on a global scale, you have to understand, uh, uh, you have to follow the rules and regulation of different countries in which you're operating. So as such, um, uh, security is a tradable finance assets. So again, for, for this, um, the laws and legal definitions varies from country to country. In some countries, security includes equities and fixed income instrument. Uh, in US, um, securities include debt securities, such as commercial papers, bonds, and debentures, and equity securities are such as stocks or more kind of the exotic type. So derivatives, forward, futures, options, and swaps. So um, again, um, so most of these terms are you know, the finance terms, um, but the bottom line is that you have to know, you have to consult with the attorney to see what's the language, what is the, uh, you know, what is the kind of the type of the assets covered and under what kind of the circumstances you can offer them, how we can trade them, things like that. So that make sure you're uh, you know complying with the regulatory environment you're operating. So now uh, one thing is that uh, so just to recap, so we know what is tokenization is. We know the difference between uh, different kind of the fundraising mechanisms like ICO initial coin offering, security token offering, and versus the like traditional venture capital or IPO which I'm gonna a little bit more talk about that when you talk about value chain or life cycle of the STO and later on. Now we need to a little bit talk about what are the benefits of tokenizations. So why this slide is very important because if you are a consultant or if you're like a, you know, working in the finance industry, you need to convince uh, traditional people, uh, usually people who are seasoned, you get used to old fashion, you know, of running things. We used to tell them that, we were, for example, we spoke with a couple of guys and they, um, they, they didn't understand how, how you can have an asset in your hand, you know, how that uh, a certificate issued on, on a piece of kind of the computer can, you know, can, um, can reflect the actual value of the asset. So basically you have to explain to them why tokenization is good and how it works. So if you're a consultant, it's good to know 
about these four benefits of tokenizations. So greater liquidity, faster and cheaper transactions, more transparency and more accessibility. So let's a little bit dive into these benefits. So it gives you more liquidity and that's a very obvious reason. So basically, um, if you have a real estate property that's worth $1 million, you know that you, uh, it's very difficult to find, you know, uh, someone who have, you can afford that to buy that. And so basically liquidity is one issues. So, um, so one thing, and then plus, um, so that's, that's uh, plus for example, in some cases like fine art, um, there might be some assessments or there some, might be some costs involved to even value that value of assets, right? So, um, so liquidity is one example that um, is, uh, for example, if, you, uh, if, if you're dealing with assets that are not liquidable, then you can use tokenization to diversify the risk and allow multiple owners to come to pictures. And then also the value of the secondary markets, it minimizes the risk for the even, uh, you know, uh, microfinancers. So, um, Again, it, it has two, uh, two values. I just want to very, give you a very simple example, right? So let's say that um, I, I, I only have $5,000 and I just want to invest that in real estate, right? So um, I buy maybe, let's say that two, two, I mean 20 tokens of the commercial real estate. And then um, I can trade that into the secondary market, right? So the value is that A, I'm taking less risk because um, if, if something goes wrong, I'm only losing 5,000. Second, second of all, um, uh, it gives more mobility and liquidity to, this, uh, to the seller because it makes it possible for him to sell that asset. And third, uh, the third benefit would be for the buyer is that uh, he would be able to sell that to the another person uh, in the secondary market. Uh, and you can use a small contract even to automate that. Pro For example, you can say that, look, anyone who is willing to pay me 7,000, I'm willing to sell it. So that condition can be enforced into the small contract and a small contract gonna automatically enforce that into the, you know, the process of tokenization. So, so you just buy 5,000 of your asset, put the condition for 7,000 for resell it, and then a small contract automatically gonna trigger that for you. When the when the customers when you when it finds the customers for your bet, so another benefit is the faster and cheaper transactions. Using a small contract, same, certain part of the exchange process is again as I was talking earlier, a small contract can automate. You can put some conditions there for 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 triggering the selling, reselling, and uh, buying, and. This automation is going to simplify the process, make the process, make the you know transaction between buyers and selling buyers and sellers much easier, faster, and with cheaper transaction costs, especially for international or global. Not to mention that um, uh, you can also use the crypto currency for those transactions instead of using the you know traditional you know. Uh, you know, the, the, the traditional banks for, for processing transactions. Another benefit is that more transparency because any, uh, as you know, the, how the blockchain works is not immutable. Uh, blockchains transactions are immutable, meaning that um, once it's recorded, um, it's just there. No one can, you know, um, tamper with that. So that's gonna give you a, a more transparency of who was the previous owners, things like that. And um, that's also adds some value to the, to the, to the process, to process of trans, uh, tokenizations. And of course, more accessibility. Um, so for example, I wanna talk about HSBC. HSBC is one of the bank that um, are working on tokenization. I'm gonna to talk about this a little bit uh, later slide. What they did or what they are doing basically, they are tokenizing their debt. So for example, they have so many debt, like $10 million debts. They have customers that they, own, they, they owe them money. Like, like a debt, but they are liquidating that debt because the debt that they want to collect is has a slow liquidity. So they try to use the tokenization to liquidate that assets to find a secondary owner for them. Um, because uh, for example, as I said, divisibility or I mean, the ability to divide um, 
that the break down the whole asset into small pieces that is uh, amazing that's how you can make this more accessible to the because for example if you're angel investors you have to have like this one million dollar to invest in something to be accredited right so but this using this mechanism uh, anyone can join and invest through the microfinancing. now one of the things is that um so there are so many examples of tokenizations, but one of the things we're starting point is that you identify what are the assets, because sometimes you don't know what asset you have or how those assets can be used. So there are, again, the finance, there are two major assets, intangible and tangible assets, uh, finance and accounting. And the intangible one is like uh, hard good, fine art, you know, part component. Um, and then um, finance, real estate, equities, Precious metal, gold, silver, and then consumable like pharma, food, and the intangible like trademark licenses, royalties, patents, and copyright. Again, one of the key elements in all of this asset, again, I'm emphasizing and I'm emphasizing is, is liquidity. So if you have an asset that doesn't have a high value and you can easily liquidate that, you may not, you may not need tokenization. So again, the element of liquidity is very important to consider when you're consulting with your client. Um, so when it comes to the physical object and financial product, again, um, collectibles and uh, you know devices uh, like fine art, you know, automobiles. Automobiles, for example, you know, when I'm talking about liquidity. Automobiles, they talk about Ferrari, like some things that it's um, you know Formula One cars, so some things that have a very unique customers, so they have a very low liquidity. So in any aspect of medical devices, we're talking about very specific unique medical device has very low liquidity. So that's what I'm talking about here. So fine art, something is very special, very high price. So you have to look at the element of liquidity to better understand how um, or to make the most of your, your tokenizations. Financial instrument, the same things like a debt I was talking, certificate, fixed income and equities. And then uh, consumables like other things like, um, like uh, coffee. And then um, now intangible as again, we talk about various rights, trademarks, licenses, patents, uh, IPs, and you know, royalties. A again, look at the book industry, music industry, content producing. You have one videos that it's very, is for example, Hollywood movies, that's very expensive, you know, um, but you can, you know, uh, tokenize that, that ownership. And, um, and then um, when it comes to the, for example, tokenization and talk about that, this tokenization can also be happening for the payment options between the bank, like central banks, bank to bank transactions, and then using the like old fashioned government fiat finance, you know, or using the cryptocurrency, you know, finance. So that's another um, advantage of tokenization that transaction inside the tokenization can be can take place using different kind of the currencies. Well, so now that we know there's so much advantages or so much uh, good things about tokenization. So the question is, what are the challenges? So the <clears throat> The first and foremost challenge is that legal environment in most countries is still is catching up because blockchain is still the new is evolving, it still is catching up. So um, maybe in your country or jurisdiction is still there are uh, figuring out what is the good legal framework around this. So the, again, that's, that's a major challenge right now. The other two challenges are where to register and issue your security token and what is the second, can you have a secondary market? Is there any kind of the um, infrastructure for your secondary market in, in where you're operating? So this is another kind of the challenges that you have to um, figure out. Now, when I'm talking about infrastructure requirement for tokenizations, um, so you have to look at the whole uh, value chain or the whole life cycle of doing this kind of the security token, right? The very, the very first step, so this is very important if you are doing consulting or if you just want to put together a business plan or kind of the requirement document for tokenizations. So you need to know all the steps involved from A to Z, right, of the tokenization because um, we are doing this for a couple of banks. So um, you need to consult with them 
So first, you need to identify what is the asset that you want to tokenize, and then you have to justify if that asset is is an asset based on what I told in previous slide is the right asset for tokenize that. Does it have a low liquidity? Does it have those characteristics that I discussed earlier? So identify what asset, and then uh, you have to come up with a very good plan for tokenize that, meaning that, okay, how you wanna create the token, how many shares, what his valuation is, blah, blah, blah. And then um, who, is, who can buy that token is individuals, it's gonna be in, business entities can buy that. And what is the trading uh, kind of the infrastructure for that? And then uh, once you issue that, you know, once you issue that kind of the tokens, who is going to pay by whom and how is the whole clearing process going to take place? And, um, and then settlement of the, the transfer of ownerships, you know, trading, like buying and selling. And then if there is an additional, like, for example, if there's a secondary market, if there is a record that you want to keep offline, you know, on top of blockchains, or is there any kind of the payment involved between the bank and the token? Because sometimes you only want to use the cryptocurrency inside that whole tokenization. Sometimes you want to use the third party banks to do the clearing houses for you. So, um, so this value chain, this whole process life cycle of starting to selling the transaction and maintaining, and then even creating the secondary markets need to be taken into consideration. And, um, one, however, one thing is that once you start looking at your country, uh, some of the sequence and steps might be changed or based on the asset that you're dealing with might be changed. For example, uh, fine art, you need to do the valuation on fine art and the valuation need to be legitimate validations, uh, valuations. So um, that's one thing that, for example, is might be different from real estate, you know, that um, uh, might be a little bit different from real estate, might be different from other assets that you're dealing with, right? So for example, if you are selling the debt of, of the bank, the valuation of that debt is different from the fine art that requires some people to do the valuations, right? So um, now, um, so <clears throat> financial institutes and then token economy. So now that we know about asset tokenizations, about their, their benefit, their challenges, and their kind of the whole um, you know, value chain, the question is how the financial institutions can benefit or how the financial institutions can implement asset tokenizations. So if you are working in a bank right now, or if you are in the finance, in, if you are in a finance, <clears throat> in a financial institute and wondering what are the steps, what are the things you need to put together in your kind of the you know, um, requirement document or if, if your business proposal for asset tokenizations, so there are five elements you have to take into consideration. As again, I'm telling you guys, we are doing this for a client. We have a bunch of banks in your client. So what we are doing, you know, we first talk about business models. Talks, in business model, we talk about um, like what type of asset you want to liquidate on what terms, conditions, you know, what if, what that platform, what platform you want to use for, for the, that like op operational part, cybersecurity, compliance and jurisdictions. So um, again, uh, you can come back to this slide and read it, um, but I'm just uh, briefly reviewing this. So um, on the business models, you have to know, figure out how you want to structure your token and uh, who is going to act as the cheap sa safekeeper for your token when the token is issued, right? Um, for example, I want to give you an example and it's a very important example I'm, I'm telling you. So uh, when you, let's say that fine art, right? So when you are tokenizing the fine art and selling the tokens to 100 people, who is going to be in custody of the physical asset when the token are issued, right? So the buyers need to know or want to make sure that there is a good insurance company covering you know, the assets, physical assets. Make sure there's someone take care of that. Or if there is a commercial real estate that you buy it, you want to make sure there is a good company take care of the building, right? and there is a security, there is an insurance involved. So they, so you have to have all of these parameters in the right place. You just can't, you just, can't just issue the token. You have to make sure, have a value of asset structure for token, and then you have to identify who is gonna be in charge of the, the physical assets 
or, you know, who's going to be, you know, the, the, the uh, back it, uh, you just want to manage or maintain the, uh, the assets. And, um, and then also you need to figure out um, how you want to, how you want to do the handle of the transactions. Uh, would you like to accept the cryptocurrency? Or you want to do the, like um, a bank from the bank? I mean, all this, for example, how you want to uh, accept the tra transaction or payment. And then um, what platform you want to accept that tokenizations? And, um, and then who is going to be the, <clears throat> the custodian banks or paying the agents or creating a lot of stuff? So all the factors that we discussed in previous value chain need to come to like life cycle. So what happens, someone buy that and they want to build a secondary market, you know what I mean? Uh, so everything's like that I need to come together in a business model that you have for the asset you're dealing with. So you just include all of these factors into your business model. Um, platform integrations, uh, depending on the business model that you have, you need to choose the platform like um, um, for operating or implementing your tokenization. So would it be a hyper see um, kind of the um, using for the, for the tokenizations. Um, and then also integrations. This is another very important aspect um, that you have to also watch is that, okay, you build a tokenization platform, but how you want to integrate that uh, with your current SaaS or current bank system that you have, you know? And then, um, uh, so, and then you also need to look at, um, talking about regulation later on, uh, like uh, you have to talk about what's your goal of tokenization, you know, how, you, how that kind of the tokenization go hand in hand with the rest of the product strategy that you have in your, in your bank <clears throat> and how you want to outreach, how you want to find the potential buyers, how you want to market that, you know, and how you want to maintain that community of the buyers, right? And, um, Obviously, even if you have a very uh, excellent uh, business model, and then if you have even uh, you have excellent business models, you have an excellent platform, and all operational considerations. One thing you should not forget that cryptocurrency, as I said before. Um, um, so, if you want to secure a bike, or if you want to secure your car, or a building, you, you're going to hire the old-fashioned security guard, right, to lock the door put the camera, you know, things like that. But when it comes to people who buy your asset on a, on a piece of paper or certificate on, on some kind of the code, right, and the tokens, uh, what the question they're gonna have is that, how you can assure me that uh, my certificate is not gonna be tampered, is it safe, you know, is no one gonna steal it or, you know what I mean? So the cyber security is a key uh, component that need to be incorporated. And then compliance with like anti-money laundering, AML, and know your customers, KYC. So they're making sure that, for example, um, some countries uh, allows the, the assets. Um, so when you're, for example, issue your asset tokenizations, in your country, there might be some restriction with regard to who, who can buy the assets, right? So you may run the AML and KYC on your customers or people who want to buy that token from you. Again, depending on your country. So um, these are things that you have to comply. And again, if, if you are in the finance, finance industry, you understand how uh, fix works. And the blocks is a very good example. There are so many use cases for anti-money laundering and NYU, uh, KYU uh, using blockchain technology for um, tracing the custody of assets or tracing the, the, the fund. And then um, jurisdictions is uh, what legal uh, kind of the frameworks, uh, like from country to country, jurisdiction to, from the city or maybe country to country, uh, you have to follow um, what are the law, law and requirement regarding to that tokenization is. And then, um, so now we talk about uh, asset tokenizations, uh, adoptions, right? Just searching on non HSBC and then asset tokenization, you're gonna see that they are, uh, they're moving their debts, uh, they're selling some of their assets, especially some of their debts into the um, tokenizations. They've been working on this for three or four years by now and Singapore Stock Exchange allowed the security token platforms, you know, JP Morgan offered the 
uh, cryptocurrency. Now, the things that some of the, again, top uh, uh, IPO, this, is, this graph shows you top uh, IPO, STO, and it's ICO, kind of the, uh, kind of the <clears throat> fundraising that's happening in 2020. Now, um, another, this, this, again, you can come back to this slide later on. Um, it shows you the difference between ST, uh, IPO, STO, and ICO from different, uh, I got this from the Ernest & Young website. Um, it shows you the differences between IPO, STO, and IC, uh, ICO uh, from different uh, characteristics or different factors, like risk, cost, for example, risk, as I said, IPO has a less risk, SEO and ICO, you know what I mean? Uh, from the, uh, like who is going to be issued, issuers, platform participations, accepted fund, and documentation requirement, investor rights, you know, controlling authority, underlying and dividends. And uh, for example, and then credibility, you know. So you can come back to this to compare, to see the comparison between these three different uh, medium for fundraisings. And, um, so, um, so basically, um, there are, these are some of the good articles. And if you want to learn more about um, some of the security laws in the United States, you can read some of this article. And obviously, um, they'll give you some information. And once you get serious, if you want to implement that, you need to discuss or consult with an attorney to, uh, uh, to hash out the details and to see if, um, if, if there is anything that you need to, uh, to comply. And uh, it's a good article for um, initial coin offering versus, uh, you know, uh, versus security token offering. And then this books, um, there's the book by uh, Brian Wu and others, Security Tokens and Stable Coin. Um, this is a great book. And I, I, I read this book and then they have a very good coverage of, uh, uh, secure token offering inside the United States. They have done some state by state, you know, kind of the comparison, uh, state by state coverage of the, the, I mean, I think they, they did up to 2019. And then they talk about some of the challenges, some of the stuff we talk about in this presentation. They, they go over that in more detail. And um, I, think, um, I think that's it on my end. So, Basically, just to recap what we discussed, maybe in one or two minutes, uh, in this presentation, we talk about what is asset tokenization is, what is the difference between ICO and STO, and what are the benefits of tokenizations, how we can leverage the tokenizations, and then what are the value chain for you know, security token, you know, issuing the security tokens. And then what is um, the process? What is the things that the financial institution need to know or need to follow in order to issue their own security token? Now, I see that there are a bunch of questions here. Let me quickly go back to the question here. Um, so um, Barry, I think I'm done here. So I'm gonna go over the questions. Yeah, sounds good, thank you. Um... I don't see much actual question from the, the, the message board. So anyone, uh, you can feel free to, uh, if you can unmute. Uh, I don't think you I, you need to, uh, my host to unmute you. You can ask question. Mm -hmm. uh, hi, this is Tarek. Uh, I have a question like you provided some uh, examples of uh, the uh, tokenization in, uh, from the banks and different uh, uh, organizations. I was wondering, is there any use case which is in real life, uh, which is basically uh, based on the Ethereum or a public network? Yes, so actually that's a good question. So let me quickly go back to here. Um, I was going to show you guys, see, if you can see my screen, asset, if you search in Google, asset tokenization with Ethereum standard ERC-20. Just, just look at ERC-20 use case. Just search uh, Sirium ERC-20 uh, use case. You can find uh, some examples that uh, 
implemented with Ethereum. So if you want to do the tokenization with Ethereum, ERC-20, it's, it's very easy. You can use that easily to tokenize the asset and then it's going to be use cases on that front too. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, one more question uh, on, okay. on the topic you were talking about the compliance and AML. Uh, the general concept around blockchain is the anonymity as well, right? So how do they, like, there are two conflicting ideas, right? Uh, AML and know your customer or KYC, basically, you know, you have to reveal your identity where on the other end blockchain says, okay, you are anonymous. <clears throat> Excuse me. So how do we handle these things? That's that's a good question. So basically, um, w one of the things is that w one of the things is that um, so w one of the things is that um, again this this is like chicken and egg, right? So, <laughs> so you can have uh, so one of the things is that it's like um, so the bank want to make sure that the, uh, the so one one things that you can do. I think that's going to be solutions here. So one thing is, is that as a bank, uh, you, you may um, do this due diligence before the persons join the blockchain. So meaning that it's called something called off the chain versus on the chain data, right? So you can do this off the chain and you can keep this information on the bank record for compliance. Now, the data of the persons that goes on the chain, that become anonymous, you know what I mean? So as, as a bank that, you know, allows you to buy that token, or like, for example, you know who the person is for the compliance, right? On the other hand, for the secondary person, whoever is in that network or blockchain right, that, that interact with that person, they, they need not to know about the person. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, can I ask a question as a follow up to that question? S sorry, what? Yeah, can I ask a question as a follow up yeah, to sure, the previous sure, question? Sure, yeah. Of course. Yeah, yes. So, um, does it mean the the blockchain network operators don't have um, an obligation of KYC or AML? See, blockchain technology is a technology. Blockchain doesn't know anything, you know. Technology is just a piece of code. A smart contract is just a piece of code. Yeah, I know. Like I'm, talking about, I'm, I'm talking about the network operators because the blockchain network has an operator. Yeah, I know. See, the thing is that the network operators, the programmers, all these people are technical people. They, um, they don't know anything. They, are, they, they, they don't know uh, anything about KYC or AML because uh, the thing is that... Um, when, as I mentioned in my, my uh, presentation, before you start the tokenization, you need to first understand the legal background and put together a business model. In that business models, you need to include in your requirement that we need this, we need this kind of the compliance. But when it comes to people who are running this, they may not know it unless it has been specifically embedded into the contract. So for example, if there's a smart contract said that look condition A and B C means uh, non-compliance, right? So that automatically gonna stop the person from transacting. So my point is that um, uh, the people who are building, developing, and even managing that, um, they uh, they basically they um, so they, they basically they are not the same as people who uh, make sure that the, the, the compliance is there because. Um, as a system admin, unless, for example, someone give you conditions that look, A, B, C, you know, if this A, B, C happens, then uh, you have to flag the customers, right? You just do your job. And in most cases, uh, as a system admin, you just want to make sure the network is running. Uh, you know, I mean, that there is no kind of the uh, attack to the networks, or for example, program doesn't have a bug. So these are like a technical job is required from you. And then those people who are doing AML or to do the compliance are mostly non-technical people. Yeah, so if I get you clearly, what you're saying is the network operators shift the obligation on those coming to build their, um, any product they want to build on the blockchain. Yeah, for, example, yeah. for example, if it's a bank coming to build that particular product on the blockchain to do their tokenization, the responsibility is on them 
then the network operators tell them before you build anything on our platform for example you need to do the kyc and so on and you yes that. yes if, if required in your country I mean, most likely required but my point is that um uh, so my point you're right so basically the network operators and programmers they are following they, they just okay there's abc they do you know there's a task list of coding a technical task list they do they're required to do those stuff requirement is just not part of the developers. They're not part of the technical team. And then there is a couple of other questions. Doesn't, uh, let me read this. There is a Hyperledger lab that uh, our capital market SG has been working on the mind interested model sample, um, tenant and token and implementation of your VC and the best. So again, uh, some people are sending comment uh, about um, some of the things that they are doing. Again, asset tokenization is so much stuff, so much use cases around that. And then uh, uh, let's the compilation of Bank of the Columbia, uh, Cambodia on that, and the best about uh, Iroha. Okay, that's good with the uh, Hyperledger Iroha. And then also Jeremy Channel. And then um, doesn't QC influence the selections of the platform as to the whether the blockchain is public or private? And QC can address and the private ledgers for the. You see, um, Again, know your customers. Someone asked, is know your customers uh, has any effect on the choice of platform? The answer is no. Um, again, um, uh, so um, for the for the like even for the public one, right? There is a way to implement KYC. You know what I mean? Um, there is a way to implement the KYC. Um, so basically, um, uh, KYC is not going to limit you on the choice of platform. That's the answer for that. And then let me see what other questions we have here. Any more questions? I don't have a question, but I, I do have a comment and it's to just, just to follow up on your mention about the Hyperledger Aroha. So um, just before Christmas is part of the five year anniversary and uh, five years looking forward for Hyperledger. The, um, there was a presentation made by um, a bunch of uh, the Japanese projects in Hyperledger Aroa presented there. And if you scoot along, I dropped a link into the presentation to 1 minute 20. This issue of the KYC in the banking scenario, uh, they've, they've established a multi-level KYC system where, um, where in your own wallet, it's kind of, there's a small amount, which is sort of public and in the majority of the banking system it's private and there's a obviously and that allows that um that allows a sort of a blend or sort of practical implementation of both worlds it's what it's worth the slides are in the talk is in japanese but the slides are in english so it's easy to kind of see how the business rules plug into a into hyperledger yeah yeah I, I saw the link yeah i'm gonna check it out and uh, thanks for your comment again um uh, the, the things that uh, the things that are happening uh, around the, uh, this i mean around the whole blockchain as a whole and around the like asset tokenization is fast you know things are moving you know and then um uh, as i said so um as you mentioned the new york customers is very important you know um when you're doing this, but maybe, you know, when you're doing, for example, tokenizing your real estate, you know, um, might be a little bit different, you know what I mean? So um, it's, um, it's, I'm going to double check, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to check where the link that you sent, I can see it right now in Japan, it's not in English, I'm going to check that after uh, this presentation, I'm going to look at that to see um, what what you guys are doing on your mm -hmm. And there's, um, there's an English version of the recording um, I'll post that into the links as well. Okay. And then, um, then uh, what else was going to, um, so I mean, really enjoying the event organizations. I'm working with the team of the uh, engineers and blockchain projects. In okay, so guys, I can also add me in LinkedIn. Um, the things is that, um, uh, asset tokenizations, uh, believe me or not, mostly is it requires business background uh, than your technical. I mean, 
we're going to have another workshop hopefully in the, in the near futures that I can show you how easy to tokenize is build a small contract uh, and then tokenize that. On the other hand, um, the business part of it, to come up with the right business model, that is more challenging, you know what I mean? So I think uh, as tokenizations, uh, especially for people who are coming from technical background, who doesn't have a background in finance, I think that's a little bit challenging for them. Uh, and that's one thing that, um, because most of the books right now, if you look at asset tokenization, they jump into the technical part, showing a small contract. On the other hand, real world, uh, especially at this stage that they're experimenting, most of the stuff has been done on the business part of it. And um, Bank of Cambodia, have a legend. that's good. But then let me just double check. Yes, let me open this one. Um, yes, I, I think we are getting close to the time. Um, and then the question seems to uh, slowly uh, slowing down. Um, thank you, Matthew. I think this okay, is sure. awesome. Yeah, this is yeah. very uh, um, active um, discussion that I, I have ever seen in so many yeah. uh, yeah, because, <laughs> conference call. <laughs> yeah, because the thing is that, because the thing is that um, most of the, I told you before, most of the people who are developers, they just like to talk about code right away. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, Without, because the things, if you don't know the big picture, you know what it is, what's the point of talking about the code? Right? Yeah, right. So, so that, yeah. Yeah, so so thank you. And uh, uh, like uh, uh, Daniela also mentioned that in the recording, I, I work with people to upload it uh, to uh, somewhere public. You can all see. I also post it on com uh, comments on the Meetup group. So you can also have the link. Uh, I see, and then we see a few information and the, the, the mingling request. If you are uh, having problem posting into the uh, the message board and you can send email to me, um, my name is uh, barryhuang at gmail.com with a little bit of summary. I think I can create a, a short temporary like email chain list just send to everyone here that is willing to share the information and projects uh, just to co com comprising of privacy and also uh, help help to mingle. Would that help? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And then also, again, uh, guys, um, stay in touch. Maybe near future, I'm going to have another workshop. Me or one of my senior team members, we're going to have another workshop that's more uh, geared toward the technical people that we do some hands-on coding there to, um, to show you one example of asset tokenization, uh, a small contract. Uh, building a front end and back end UI and all that. So uh, for now, again, thanks again, everyone for attending this. And then uh, you can also add me LinkedIn or, you know, message, uh, you know, uh, Barry and he's going to forward it to me. And then have a wonderful afternoon, Barry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Matthew. Have a great weekend. Bye, guys. You too. Take care. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thank bye. Everyone. bye. Thank bye. you. Bye. 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 Bye.